In this video, we're going to take a look at some galvanic cells with very important practical applications, looking specifically at various types of batteries and at fuel cells. A battery is just a galvanic cell that's been engineered or designed for a particular application. And we're going to divide batteries into two categories based essentially on whether they can be recharged or not. Primary cells are designed for a single use, and the most common and popular type of primary cell is the alkaline battery, which you can buy at the grocery store. These are the Duracell, Energizer, long cylindrical batteries that you can buy at the grocery store. Dry cells are another important type of primary cell designed for a single use without the ability to be recharged. But secondary cells can be recharged, and these batteries are very important in rechargeable electronic devices like cell phones, cameras, etc., etc. And in these, you might find nickel cadmium batteries, lithium ion batteries, obviously, hugely important practical applications there. You've probably read about lithium ion batteries in the news, and lead acid batteries, which are put into automobiles and are recharged by the automobile's engine as it drives. The Daniel cell was one of the first reported batteries, first publicly reported batteries. And this was way, way back. This image that you see on the left is from the early 20th century, 1904. So the Daniel cell goes way, way back, and it's based on a very simple redox process, the oxidation of zinc metal by copper 2 plus to form zinc 2 plus and copper metal. Although the engineered design here looks a little bit complicated, realize that this is, conceptually speaking, identical to the two-beaker galvanic cell that we've been looking at previously with the zinc anode undergoing oxidation and electrons coming out here, and the copper cathode undergoing reduction and electrons flowing in here with a salt bridge. This design has all of those elements just in a relatively compact package, which has engineering advantages, obviously. More typically nowadays, we make use of more carefully engineered batteries, and one example of that is the zinc manganese dry cell. It's called a dry cell because the battery is filled with a relatively dry paste, there is some water in here, that contains manganese 4 oxide, ammonium chloride, zinc chloride, and water. And this is the cathode. So at this carbon rod, which is where electrons really come in, MnO2 undergoes reduction to Mn2O3. I encourage you to pause and verify that this is actually a reduction of manganese from this compound to this compound. And at the anode, which is actually the can that lines the outside of the battery, zinc undergoes oxidation to zinc 2 plus. And so we see two electrons transferred in this redox reaction. Practically speaking, electrons come in the top into the cathode and electrons leave the bottom out of the anode and can be used to power an electrical load, of course. And the cell potential here is about 1.5 volts when it's all said and done. And of course, this is not a standard state situation by any means. The concentrations are not one mole per liter. And so we could think about the Nernst equation and various other variables, temperature, that kind of thing, to determine this. Alkaline batteries use a similar redox process to the dry cell, but are under basic conditions, meaning there's quite a bit of hydroxide around and there's quite a bit more water. So these, you've got to be a little bit more careful with. Over time, they'll eventually leak this strongly basic hydroxide solution and corrode. And you may have seen this if you found batteries in an old remote control or something along those lines. So in an alkaline battery, at the cathode, we're again seeing the oxidation of, excuse me, the reduction of MnO2 to Mn2O3, and we're seeing the oxidation of zinc. Here it's a little bit different with the hydroxide around. Now we're balancing the redox reaction under basic conditions, if you like, and zinc is undergoing oxidation to zinc oxide, water, and two electrons. And so we see the anode here is this kind of inner solution, and electrons are leaving here and the cathode is the sort of outer solution and electrons are coming in here in an alkaline battery. Nickel cadmium batteries are our first example of a secondary cell and these are rechargeable and use a really interesting kind of jelly roll design where the two electrodes are lined up in sort of sheets so that there's a huge contact surface area between the electrodes and the electrolyte or separator that you see here. 
And so the cathode in a nickel cadmium battery involves the reduction of NiO2, that's nickel 4, to NiOH2, this is nickel 2, that's a reduction process involving two electrons. And at the anode, cadmium metal is oxidized to cadmium hydroxide, CdOH2, and two electrons. Now this is during discharge. To recharge this battery, we would run the redox reactions in reverse. The cathode would become the anode and the anode the cathode, if you will, with reduction of CdOH2 to Cd taking place and oxidation of NiOH2 to NiO2 occurring. But under discharge conditions, electrons will leave the anode at the bottom and come in the cathode at the top here in this drawing. The lithium ion battery has hugely important practical applications and, involve, and it involves oxidation and reduction processes involving lithium metal, kind of, sort of, and lithium cations. And so at the anode, reduction of lithium cations occurs. So we've got X lithium cations combining with X electrons. Now lithium metal itself is highly, highly reactive. So it's advantageous to actually impregnate those lithium atoms in a relatively stable matrix. And this is often done using graphite or other um, carbon nanotube materials or uh, very carbon heavy materials. So just as a general representation of that, let's call it XC6. And a lithium atom can incorporate into a six carbon ring like this to form X moles, if you like, of LiC6. And this represents reduction because the oxidation state of lithium in this LiC6 formula unit is zero. So we've gone from lithium one to lithium zero. On the oxidation side, LiCoO2 is converted to, is, is oxidized to form a compound of lithium, cobalt, and oxygen with fewer lithiums, and some lithium cations are freed along with X electrons. And so the oxidation process here, again, we would normally think about it as lithium metal oxidized to lithium plus. Because lithium metal is so reactive, it's very common to uh, engage this oxidation with this lithium cobaltate compound right here. Hugely, hugely important. And, and during discharge, we see the spontaneous process, the lithium metal undergoing oxidation to lithium plus. And when the cell is charging, lithium cations are converted back to lithium metal atoms in this C6 matrix. The lead acid battery is the battery that we find in automobiles, and it's based on a combination of lead and sulfuric acid. At the positive terminal, lead 4 oxide is reduced to lead sulfate. Notice this is lead 4 going to lead 2, if we do the oxidation number math there. And so a reduction is occurring there. And at the anode, lead metal is undergoing oxidation to lead sulfate. Interesting that lead sulfate shows up as a product both at the anode and cathode here. And this is rechargeable, and as we saw earlier, when we're charging, the reverse reactions are occurring. Lead sulfate is undergoing oxidation to lead four oxide and reduction back to lead metal in the two electrodes. And, and here again, similar to the nickel cadmium battery where there's a very large surface area between the electrodes and the separator, the lead acid battery is similarly designed with these plates of positive and negative electrodes. So we have, for example, a cathode plate here and an anode plate here with the electrolyte liquid able to interpenetrate between these small spaces between the plates. This large surface area helps facilitate the flow of electrons and ensure that this battery, which needs to supply quite a bit of current uh, in order to get a motor going, right, is able to supply enough electrons in a short enough amount of time to give the power needed to get a car running. Fuel cells are a really interesting example of a galvanic cell based on essentially the energy built into hydrogen, H2, as a fuel. And they're really interesting in that the overall reaction that's occurring here is the combination of H2 and O2 to form H2O. But the two half reactions involve the oxidation of H2. Notice that this is the oxidation process that we saw in earlier discussions of the standard hydrogen electrode. In this fuel cell, the anode is essentially the standard hydrogen electrode. Here I've just doubled the half reaction so that we get four electrons transferred. And on the cathode side, O2 is undergoing reduction to H2O 
along with four H pluses and four electrons. And so if we combine these together, if we add the two half reactions and see what drops out, we'll realize that the overall reaction is two H2s combining with an O2 to form two H2Os. So very simple overall reaction, amazing byproduct, right? Amazing that only water is formed as a byproduct. And we can get an electric current and a voltage out of this based on the half cell or electrode potentials for these two half reactions. So fuel cells are fantastic for supplying electrical uh, current and voltage from very simple ingredients. Although hydrogen presents some practical difficulties as a fuel because it's a gas, very hard to store, very hard to transport. And so it's got some fundamental limitations in that respect.